Worst day of my life was when we went through the doors at Glasgow Airport when you've got two young kids, everybody, your full family, my wife's and my family at the door going, and they're all just in tears. And you go through the door and you go to the toilet with my sons and they go, why is everybody crying, Dad? And it's like, shut up. I'm Alex McKinnon, this is Transitions. Today I had the opportunity to chat with Laurie McKinnon. Laurie is currently the CEO of the Newcastle Jets. He was a player, a coach and a mayor. Laurie also has many great ideas on why athletes should focus on life after sport. Football has taken you from Scotland to China to Newcastle to Melbourne. Can we begin in Scotland in your transition as a player from Scotland to Australia and how you handled that? Yeah, look, I, I signed my first professional contract when I was 19. I was married and had a son. Life in Scotland wasn't great. You know, if you, you had a job, you couldn't leave. We never had a car, we never had a phone because things were really tight. And uh, we just thought we'd take the opportunity to come to Australia. Was it tough leaving home? Worst day of my life was when we went through the doors at Glasgow Airport when you've got two young kids, everybody, your full family, my wife and my family at the door going, and they're all just in tears. And you go through the door and you go to the toilet with my sons and they go, why is everybody crying, Dad? And it's like, shut up. In those days, like 31 years ago, just a lot further away then. You know, you never had the internet and emails and that in those days. So it was a huge move for us, huge and a huge gamble. Did you think you'd be still be here now? No, we thought we was here for a year. After that first year, um, I'd went to Heidelberg in the National League, then they sold me to Apia in the National League in Sydney. I was doing okay. Now we'll stay another year and we'll stay another year. So we just kept renewing, the clubs kept renewing their sporting visas. And then I think maybe after about four or five years we got our residency. It wasn't until I was on the Central Coast of the Manors I became a citizen before one of our games, which was one of the biggest thrills of my life, becoming a noisy citizen in front of 10,000 people. Can you tell me why you chose coaching uh, once you finished playing? When I came up to Sydney, I went to Blacktown City in the Old National League and I ruptured my kidneys. I was in the hospital for 12 days and thought I was going to lose my kidney. And I came back near the end of that season and the club got relegated. I had just signed a new contract during that season to re-sign my Appia like in the National League and I broke my leg. I decided that while I was out on my broken leg, I'd done started doing my coaching badges. Like I was about 31, 32 at the time. I was fortunate enough, Northern Spirit, who were the old National League team, was like the big Aussie club who started really well and then it faded. I went there in two seasons as head coach and my first season I won Coach of the Year, which was a great honour. I'd never won an award in football in my life, never won Best and Fairest, never won anything. And the, when the Mariners were going to start, they'd approached me. When the Old National League came to an end, they'd approached me to set up the Mariners and obviously I was there for a long time and went in there for five years as head coach, a year as general manager of football, a year in China coaching, come back as general manager of football again and then became the mayor. When you, when you go home and you put your head on the pillow, what do you think? <laughs> I'm going, what do I do? Get a nice necklace, get big robes and a funny hat, look like Captain Pugwash, never wore it. Um, but it was a real proud moment, you know, I left school at 15 and a half, got married at 18, 19, came to Australia and all of a sudden I became the mayor of Gosford, which was a real honour. Like, and although it was a special time for me, when I came in, people used to bow at me, and say, hi Mr Mayor, good morning Mr Mayor. I'm like, hey, my name's Laurie. I was, my name was Laurie a week ago before I was a mayor. I still go to the toilet and pee the same as you do. So I was in the lift, I came back in and the wee guys, same guy, went, Mr. Mayor. And I'll, I'll not swear, but I said, have you ever been told to F off by the mayor before? And I went, no. I said, well, F off, never call me the mayor again. Call me Laurie, my name's Laurie. So for that day onwards at council, unless it was a the, a public a ceremony, the, the council meeting where I had to be called Mr Mayor. You're approachable. You're I was just Laurie. Laurie, you're the Jet CEO. Can you tell me or fill me in on a few things that you do in regards to players retiring and how the club can help them? We're the, the club with the most 
players, W League and A League, going through university, TAFE and doing courses on the, on the outside, which is fantastic to know. One of the W League girls want to, doesn't know what she's wanting to do at uni and she fancied sports science, so we put her as an intern with our sports science department. So she was there for quite a few weeks, loved it. And, and for us to do that's easy. You know, just ask us. If somebody, if our players, the W League players want to do some of that, we'll definitely get them involved. Obviously, if a lot of players when they retire want to become involved in the club. You know, some of them think it's their God-given right that they should get a job in football. And over my years in football, I've saw some of those guys coming in and maybe lasting a season and then leaving because when you actually have to work 85 or 95 or 96 as a full day, some of these boys aren't used to it and no willing to do that transition or not ready for it yet because they think it's just an easy transition. So they have to realise they're going into the work environment that everybody else is in. Yeah. You have to work and be willing to work. You don't get paid to do nothing. As a club and as the PFA, they, they're really good with football. But we need to be aware of mental mental issues with some of these players because I've saw it and it's really hurt some of these players and their families because they just can't deal with it. Labby Hiliti, who was at the Jets, went to the Wanderers, went to Europe, won a Champions League medal. He's back at the Jets, retired at 32. He was wanting to be the youth team coach and Mark Jones, who was the former coach, wanted him to be. He never did his accreditation, so I put my hand up and said, I'll be the coach, so he can be my assistant. So you're the CEO? And the youth team coach. Youth team coach. And Labby's my assistant, but Labby, he'll be at training three or four sessions a week with the first team. He's at all the youth team, he'll come in my office, we'll talk briefly what we're doing at training, he'll go and set it all up. So, And you know, Labby's getting a part-time wage to do that, but he's willing to sacrifice, put sacrifices in to further his career. Labby's Unusual because there are not that many boys will put themselves out like that. He's well, he's making a big sacrifice. He's willing to, willing to work. He'll be rewarded down the track. We've got seven or eight of our boys doing co the coaching courses now. So we're fortunate our technical director of our academy is accredited to do all the licenses. So we've got some of the W League girls and some of the A League boys doing the C license. And my advice to players now coming through is they should do their coaching badges as early as possible.